NVIDIA's website. We'll start off that way. And this is a stock that like listeners, anybody who's been listening to us for a while, we've talked about it a couple different times. And, um, you know, mostly because like if I pull up the chart and again, we have these on YouTube, everybody. Um, if you subscribe, thank you so much. Uh, we do appreciate you coming back every week. I appreciate you smashing the like button so that the Google overlords uh, will reward us with their algorithm. And, um, you know, if you haven't subscribed your first time here, welcome. Feel free to subscribe. We are always talking stuff. We love to talk stocks. But you notice that in, I just brought the chart here in NVIDIA. Uh, and I think, Joe, we were talking about it originally back here, January or December, as it was making this huge big base and trying to come out of this base. It kind of like it tried to and then it failed. It rolled back towards the bottom and then it broke out again and it pulled back. And a 200 day moving average done a nice job of holding that 200 day moving average the whole way up. We now have these two saucers coming up again. And then we just reported earnings, which we're going to talk about right now, which is threatening to bust it out to uh, all time highs up about 5% today, Joe. So I thought this would be a really good one for us to go through. I do own this one personally. So full disclosure for everybody so that, you know, I am talk talking my book a little bit here, uh, but I've owned it for a long time. Um, I'm up about, uh, Joe, I'm up about 500%. Who is that all? Yeah, on NVIDIA. Just, you know, the lesson there, Joe, is that it's never too late, right? I mean, oftentimes we'll find stocks, you know, people talking about it and say, oh, I can't take it now. It's moved too much, you know? Um, has it? <laughs> has it really? I mean, you know, there's no time like the present, you know? Um, so anyways, we're on NVIDIA's website here, Joe, and you can see that, you know, this pulls up here and it just, I thought it might be useful just to give people a little background in case they're new to the NVIDIA story. Uh, transform transformational power of accelerated computing from gaming to enterprise data center. So really, and I think Joe, you talked about building a computer um, a few months ago when we were talking about NVIDIA and you had said that the graphic card prices had just gone up substantially. Yeah, yeah, we, we mentioned that in our, uh, in our chip shortage episode as well. Uh, and so when you're, yeah, when you're going to build your, your own computer, at least for, for gaming, uh, generally the most expensive component, except for maybe the, the monitor, if you consider that a component, is the graphics card, which essentially keeps your games running and makes them look as, as pretty and as possible and keeps them as high functioning as they possibly can be. And so the graphics card alone is it's not a it's not a card it's not like a a little computer chip or something it's like this big thing and it's got fans attached to it and they can cost anywhere from two hundred dollars up to well over a thousand dollars but we'll generally run you three to five hundred dollars for a good one yeah and i mean there was a lot of reports earlier and they were talking about that chip shortage ep episode um just go back into our history folks and you can pick up that episode that was a really cool episode um, but, you know, they were talking about how, you know, the demand with for because of Bitcoin mining for NVIDIA chips was so high that they actually had to spin off a different type of chip so that people would stop buying the chips used for the graphic for the com computer con computing consoles and everything. So, yeah, so they're making the GPUs that are used in, um, you know, high performance gaming computers and consoles. Um, and you can see that they've got a lot of, you know, marketing materials to that. Then, of course, you know, they're also you know, this big data center business, you know, there's, um, I think it's called DPUs. Um, yeah, you get the GPUs and then the data center and Edge. And Edge is a huge thing right now. And again, you know, being able to get information to users regardless of where they are with, you know, as little latency as possible. And a lot of this information now, right, Joe, is all video. I mean, look at us, right? We're doing a podcast, but we're also recording this and putting them up on YouTube. So there's a lot of video and everything. And, and all of that, obviously, um, is pretty taxing on um, on the system. So I'm just going to go to the investors relations part here, and you can see the stock is up today. Yeah, yeah. GPUs. Yeah, that's a GPU yeah. right there. And for the, those who haven't seen one before, two fans right there. Yeah, two fans. Keep it's it cool. it's about the size of like maybe one of those like big Samsung Galaxy Note phones. If you've ever seen those, oh, yeah, yeah, really yeah. big or like I've got like. They might be like the size of this notebook about. Gotcha. Gotcha. And one of the things here jumps out at me, um, May 21st, you know, they reported they're going to stock, they're going to try and split their stock four for one. So just as a reminder to everybody, because this always comes up when people talk about stock splits, it doesn't really change anything. Okay. It just, no, it doesn't. 
a $600 stock, if you do a four to one, is now going to trade at 150, right? It does nothing to the market cap. The size of the company is the same. Um, there is the argument, though, that by splitting a price of a high price stock, by splitting a stock of a high price, you know what I mean, that, <laughs> that it reduces the cost and then maybe opens it up to more individual investors who otherwise couldn't afford to buy it. And that's again, generally why they do it, right? Yeah, yeah, but again, are there any I mean, are there any other reasons that that companies split their stock? Really? No, I feel like it's marketing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's. I mean, because think about it, you can do fractional share buys now, and most most uh, platforms will let you do that. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's possible if you only have like an account with a thousand bucks in it, right? You know, then maybe. Yeah, maybe... that I do honestly like. I find myself in that position sometimes, just because I don't have a lot of money to throw around, and so like, as I've as I've said for the past several weeks now, my my cash position is very low, and so I don't have a lot to throw around. But at the same time, I don't really like buying portions of shares i don't know it, there, there's just something about it that i don't i don't like i'd rather own a whole number rather than 0 0.5 or 1.25 and so for me when i look at a stock like nvidia that's at 650 bucks i would have to i would have to free up a decent amount of cash in order to just buy one share and so uh, i have i have not purchased any as of yet yeah. So, I mean, in that case, then it does, I can see where that would make sense. And maybe it does open it up to more in investors. The other, the other point that I was just going to make is that, you know, it's not like it changes your percent return, right? You know, I mean, 10% right. return on $600 stock doesn't matter. You know, I mean, it's a 10% yeah. return is a 10% return. So, yeah. And I also don't like having teeny tiny positions and stuff. Like I, I don't, I don't have, what, what is my smallest position here? It's my smallest position is probably still like, three percent yeah okay so you and i are very different on that but again we're yeah. different we've talked about this on the show in past episodes you and i are at very different points you know i've got family kids house more obligations and i'm you know i'm not retiring soon but i mean i'm, I'm far close to much yeah yeah it's on the it's on the horizon for you whereas <laughs> right. my my road is right. i'm really just at the beginning of my road so, yeah, so I'm, very I'm different more, yeah. positions I'm much uh, less interested in in uh, running a concentrated portfolio than you you might be. But anyways, let's so let's dive in here, Joe. And so you know, again, we're talking about um, gaming uh, demand, um, potentially cryptocurrency demand. I'd be looking for in information on the, the data center. You know, again, how are we delivering businesses, delivering information to their their end users, be it employees or consumers? So you see, right at the top here. Record revenue of 5.6 billion, up 84% year over year. Now, impressive. Yeah. I think about how big this company is. This company has a market cap of several hundred billion, right? 400 billion. Wow. Job. This is a $400 billion company. With, and, and it just grew its revenue 84% year over year. That's, that's, that's not easy to do. No. <laughs> when you get to a certain size, it's not because a lot of big numbers, right? It, it's it's much easier to double your sales when you're doing a hundred million in sales than it is when you're doing billions. Um, record gaming revenue. So 2.76 or a little bit less than half comes from gaming. And that more than doubled. That totally makes sense to me. Now, I don't know the answer to this question. And I don't, somebody can mention in the comments, uh, or Joe, maybe you know off the top of your head, but do, do you know, does the NVIDIA power the uh, PlayStation or the Xbox? Do we, do we know? Or is this all coming from, from PC gamers? I think that's all PCs. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, in the, in the comments, if anybody happens to know, um, I, that would be interesting. And then of course, data center revenue, the lion's share of the remainder, you know, still a billion left over after this, but 2 billion in sales for, for data center revenue up 79% year over year. Um, so I don't think there's anything, anything bad there. And then 
they, they do give you a quarter over quarter. They say that the, the top line, so again, that 5.7 billion in revenue uh, grew 13% sequentially. So in the quarter, they did 13% more. And that's it's pretty good, but that's not amazing that, in with having the perspective of those other games. Yeah, yeah, but still, I mean, if you can post double digit um, quarter over quarter growth. Oh yeah, I, for a company this big, again, I, I that's that's good. Okay, so gap earnings per share was three dollars and three cents. Also up one hundred and six percent. See, and you know, the thing that always jumps out to me, and then, and then look at this, Joe. Wow. Up 31% from the prior quarter. Yeah, that's so we, okay. <laughs> so what we just talked about, right? 84% on the top line, but that translated into 106% growth on the bottom line. We like to see that, don't we? And then sequentially, 13% revenue growth that translated into 31% or bottom line growth. That's really uh, good. So, and again, that shows you operating leverage, right? That's why, you know, in, in the class, the how to talk stocks class that I, that I do, um, I often will mention, hey, keep track of what's happening with operating margin. Because if operating margin is growing, it's showing that they have leverage. So as their sales grow, the profitability grows and they're able to, to leverage that. Um, and you're seeing that here, I think. Definitely. And then the non-GAAP numbers are, are similar, 103% year over year, 18% prior quarter. So the non-GAAP um, usually backs out one-time events or what are considered to be one-time events, like you know shareholder compensation, that type of thing. Uh, strong demand for products driving revenue, no clue. <laughs> uh, data center business continues to expand AI to process computer vision, conversational AI. That's interesting. Natural That's cool. language understanding. So a lot of these maybe more complex systems that are taking what we say to them in doing stuff with what we're saying to them, uh, maybe are, are using its systems. Uh, gaming and design markets, larger ways of our laptops computing platforms is accelerating. They talk about how they are now one year in on their acquisition of Mellanox, which improved their, how deeply they dive into data center. And they're trying to acquire ARM, ARM Holdings, which is an architect, think of it, the, them as the architect for chip design. And that's a huge potential uh, coup and many people don't. Many people question whether or not that deal is actually going to pass muster with regulators. So I think there has been a headwind to Nvidia's stock because of that. If there were any protect, potentially good news to come from it, then I think that that would help Nvidia shares head higher. So investors, listeners probably want to just every once in a while Google Arm Holdings Nvidia and see whether or not there's any, any movement on that, on that merger. Gaming, cloud computing, AI, robotics, self-driving cars, genomics, and computational biology. NVIDIA continues to do impactful work and invent a better future. I mean, those are, those are about the buzzwordiest buzzwords you can get. Yeah, they're all over the map. And that's Which all is good. That's a good thing. Yeah, these are all multi-billion dollar market opportunities. Oh, yeah. They do pay a dividend. Very generous 16 cent dividend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what's that? It's, uh, <laughs> that works out to a 0.1% yield. Oh, they're so nice. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're definitely, and, and that's fine. This is a growth company, obviously. <laughs> yeah, they won't be showing up on our best dividend stocks list. No, <laughs> the best dividends report will not include NVIDIA. Um, yeah, that report that we put out it, for uh, members, free trial below, um, that includes stocks that score high in our research that have four dividend yields of greater than 1.5%. So they would need to substantially increase their dividend to make that cut. So, I mean, it just gives you again, you know, the quarterly progression, the year over year growth, 84%, revenue of 5.7 billion. 
gross margin was 64.1%. That's down from last year a little bit. Down, yeah, down a percent from last year, up a percent from last quarter. Huh. I guess I'll call that kind of a wash, but something that we should keep track of. It could be that some of their... Yeah, I mean, for those listening, it's we're talking about a difference of between 65 and 64 percent so it's not like they're it's not yeah. like they're close to being unprofitable <laughs> they're they're doing just fine yeah. but those that could be a a minor growing pain right and if you look at this is what we were talking about with that financial leverage operating expenses only grew 63 percent while revenue grew 84 percent so yeah. that, again, that's why your operating income, net income, and diluted earnings per share all more than doubled. And then they just do the, the non-GAAP numbers, which are, are pretty similar. And then their outlook for the second quarter, revenue is expected to be 6.3 billion. So if I flip back here to my NVIDIA chart that shows me um, one year ago's quarter. So the quarter that they're projecting 6.3 billion in, they reported 3.9 billion last year in that okay. quarter. Okay, so... So they're going to go from 3.9 to 6.3. I should have my calculator out right now. So it's not, obviously <laughs> it's not 100% because that would be 7.8. Exactly. So, so it's but it's it's still going to be healthy growth, but it's going to be a deceleration. It's going to be a deceleration from what? Yeah. We so that's uh six about sixty two percent. So sixty two percent, which still Joe going back to again to that chart where I can see those, uh, that would still put it pretty high relative. I mean, if you look at the three quarters prior to this quarter, they just reported. Growth was 61%, 57%, and 50%. So still forecasting pretty strong growth there. That's so that's I'll, I'll call that good. And the other thing is too, Joe, right? I mean, we want companies to underpromise and overdeliver. Right. That's a key piece of metric for our scoring system is the number of beats over the last four quarters. We incorporate that into the score. So we, we like management teams that understand, okay, you have to sandbag a little bit, right? You have to, you know, keep some downward pressure on people's uh, optimism and then report better than, better than what they were expecting. And, and historically, you'll get rewarded for that um, in a higher share price. They beat on this earnings report, right? I know we haven't, haven't quite gotten there. We usually pull up another tab with Seeking Alpha, but. Yeah, let's, let's do that now. And yeah, why not? And just see how that matches up. Um, I'm guessing they beat just because of the way that the price reacted today. Um, yeah, yes. beat by 200 oh, yeah. million. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's pretty good um, versus the estimate. So there's 250 million more in revenue than, than they were, than Street was expecting. And then the earnings, that's a, that's a big beat. That is a big gap beat. by 40 cents. And gap by fifty one cents. So, so that's a yeah. And then you can actually see here too that they have the uh, revenue expected to be six point three billion plus or minus two versus five point five the prior year. Gross margin sixty four point six uh, to sixty six point five. And actually, that's what we were just worrying about was the gross margins. So I guess we shouldn't worry, Joe. No, because you know, yeah, they fell a hundred basis points year over year last quarter to sixty four point one. But their guidance is actually saying, yeah, no, we're going to do better. It's going to run 64.6 .6 to 66.5. Yeah, the, the, oh. the margin doesn't concern me. What does kind of concern me as somebody who doesn't have a position but might want to open one is the, the deceleration. It's, it's a silly thing to say, but the deceleration in revenue growth. Like, I feel like now is probably is probably their their peak growth for at least a little while because as as we just did the math like they would have to they would have to smash next quarter out of the park for it to be anywhere near what it was this quarter 
Yeah, right? the, the other thing, comment that's a great point too, and we talked about this when we started talking about semiconductor stocks last fall. And we actually talked it again when we started saying, hey, uh, maybe you know, tap the brakes a little bit on semiconductors now. And this was about a month ago, six weeks ago. There is a certain amount of seasonality associated to when orders come in and when they get filled. And typically the summer months are a weaker period for semiconductors uh, based on the book to bill ratio, which is again, the ratio of, of the orders to how many are being fulfilled. So it could very well be, we'd have to look at that, Joe. It could be that this is a, going a seasonally weaker quarter anyways. So, and then it would reaccelerate as you get into the fall again. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is a, I think a real, this is a, nothing here in this report that makes me not want to own the stock, that's for sure. Yeah, I agreed. Broad and wave of laptops powered by NVIDIA's second generation RTX graphics and launch of the Geo, G, G, GeForce RTX. It's a mouthful. Starting at $1,000. Yeah, these are not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> they get a lot more expensive than that too, believe me. Really? $800 for gamers oh, yeah. and creators? I, I, wonder if, I wonder if those, pl those prices are inflated already because of the chip shortage i don't know how that works like when it's directly from the manufacturer because most of the stuff that you're that you're going to buy on the open market is going to be from amazon or best buy or walmart or something like that you're not going to get it directly from nvidia or directly from amd most of the right. time so i i wonder if I wonder if that's like <laughs> that that's their their price that they're setting and yeah we're we're going to we're going to still make money off of this despite the chip shortage or if that's like in a perfect in a in a perfect world where there wasn't this shortage we would be charging that much I imagine there's some amount of increase that gets passed on to the wholesaler and then the distributor yeah, yeah, people are people are surprisingly stuff. willing to spend that kind of money too if they know they're getting a really yeah. good product. Like yeah. it's my my build last summer cost all in just about a thousand dollars with accessories and everything, um, not including a monitor. But I mean, you you can you can look up pre built ones that are four thousand or more easily. Wow. So. Yeah, there's there's definitely there's definitely a lot of a lot of willingness to spend that much, especially with the with the continuing rise of esports. Yeah, so here they're talking about the data processing units, those DPUs. Um, they're talking about the data center, uh, just to strengthen the data center and different things that they're rolling out, new chips. Um, you know, apparently they, you know, I, this makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, so if we're looking at AI stocks, and we're thinking that artificial intelligence is going to improve processes for a lot of different businesses. Uh, clearly, that's going to require a lot of compute power, right? So, you know, it seems like NVIDIA's got a really good opportunity there. Um, yeah, and just looking through here, I don't know if there's anything else here that you see that would be... I don't know what happened. All right, and then here we go. Quite honestly. <laughs> Yeah, and then if this is where the rest of the other billion in revenue that yeah. was missing comes in. Professional visualization, 372 million in first quarter sales up 21%. Uh, so that's for real-time 3D design and collaboration. And it looks like they sell to industrial products companies, BMW, et cetera. Yeah, so companies that are probably doing like 3D modeling for components, that would be my mm -hmm. guess. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. And then an automotive, which is, you know, one big reason a lot of people say, okay, geez, think about the electrification of automobiles and how many more chips are in those automobiles. And as we get autos are more and more sophisticated, they're doing things like self-driving, right? right? Just think about how you're going to have to digest all of that information very quickly, <laughs> with no latency, that is coming from the sensors and the cameras and stuff on the outside of the vehicle and, you know, make decisions in, in microseconds based on that information. Uh, so I think a lot of people have thought that that could be a very big future driver. All right. That's, that's a future driver for the company. No and pun intended. 
Yeah, <laughs> right, driver. And, um, you know, if you look at the automotive sector, that's it, obviously not doing much for them right now. Down 1% year over year, 154 million in revenue. Um, makes me wonder too, whether or not some of the shutdowns and then, you know, the difficulty in production of these autos is probably weighing on it a little bit. Definitely wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Yeah, so, it doesn't really matter though. It's a, that's a sliver of their overall pie, if you will. Yeah. So, so, um, so I mean, what do you think, Joe, overall there? Uh, was there anything that, uh, that I, that jumps out at you or the, what's your takeaway? Um, I was, I think I was, I was pretty blown away by those first few lines. And then as we, as we got a little bit further down, I think the, the excitement wore off a little bit. Um, I do, I do almost feel like I, I may have, I may have missed the boat on this stock, which is fine. It's not, it's not like there's any shortage of good ideas out there. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I would, I think I would, I would really want to see like what their, what their Q2 looks like and kind of reassess from there. I'm, I'm not sure, not sure how long they can, they can continue growing at this rate, considering how big they are already. Yeah, I, I think that um, I'm glad that I I'm glad I own it. I'm not selling it. It's part of my forever portfolio. I think just looking at <coughs> excuse me the chart we looked at before, I, I like it. Um, I think that if it trades down, I would be a buyer. I'd be looking for down three to a five percent day. Uh, usually volatility will give us that on you know even on a big growth stock like this. And uh, so I would be approaching it and looking at it and saying, you know, okay, I get myself down three to five percent day. I'm going to take some. So if you like the stock, I'd be looking for an entry. There's nothing in that earnings report that scares me off. 